workshops are jointly sponsored by the U.S. Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America's Sea Scout Program. My name is Bruce Johnson, and I serve as the chief of the Coast Guard Auxiliary's youth programs. Our co-host is Josh Gilliland, whom you've already met, chair of the National Sea Scout Committee's uh, marketing and communications team. Josh will be coordinating your questions in the third part of the program. Coast Guard Tech Talks are held on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 2100 Eastern, 2000 Central, 1900 Mountain, and 1800 Pacific Time. Each program focuses on a single science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM topic. These topics are chosen to support the Sea Scout Advancement Program. Next month's Tech Talk workshop will be on Rules of the Road, which is requirement nine of both the ordinary and able ranks. Tonight's topic is Engines, which is a level three Sea Scout Advancement elective. Our presenter is Coast Guard MK1 Taylor Sweeney. MK1 Sweeney is a 15 year Coast Guard veteran with over nine years of sea time. He did his Coast Guard basic training at Tracen Cape May, New Jersey, and has served on the cutter Vaishan, the Aspen, and the Resolute. He served as part of the commissioning crew of the Coast Guard cutter Richard Snyder, a new centennial class response boat, fast response boat, home ported in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. He currently serves as the Assistant Engineering Petty Officer for Coast Guard Station San Key in Clearwater, Florida. He reports that after seven moves all over the country, a wife of 11 years, three children, and two dogs, the decision to join the Coast Guard was the best decision he could have made for himself. One last thing, we've muted your microphones to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box or Q&A. Um, and Josh will be monitoring chat and will be able to leave time to answer your questions. So let's welcome Taylor Sweeney. Take it away. Hello, everybody. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about some internal combustion engines. Uh, Kind of a basic run through. Uh, we have some nice visuals and uh, a fairly decent breakdown of how those work and the uh, uh, functional components of both. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and bring up a nice PowerPoint uh, I have for you guys and gals. Uh, I don't know for sure who uh, is all in here, but uh, let's get started. Uh, just bear with me. I'm working on an older laptop, um, so loading takes a second, but uh, I'm almost there. All right. Okay, uh, we're working with the Auxiliary Seamanship Course, or OXI, Chapter 3, Internal Combustion Engines. Uh, internal Combustion Engines, both diesel and gas change or convert heat energy into work by burning fuel in a closed combustion chamber. The pistons use a up and down motion, uh, thus they are classified as reciprocating engines. Uh, ignition principles uh, for gasoline engines, they use a spark ignition system uh, called a spark ignition engine. Fuel and air is mixed in a carburetor or uh, an injection. Uh, I have my one second. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm a relative novice with Zoom, so if I have some hiccups with that, I apologize. Bear with me. Uh, fuel and air, number three, fuel and air mixed in a carburetor or injection chamber if it is fuel injected. Uh, fuel is drawn into cylinders. Fuel or, and air uh, is mixed and ignited by electronic spark, electric spark uh, from spark plugs. Uh, so here we got a pretty decent diagram. Um, you have a cross-cut view of a cylinder, uh, and this shows from the first stage to the final stage. Uh, you have your piston here, uh, you have your cylinder, you have your valves at the top, your intake port or intake, uh, intake port, excuse me, intake valve and exhaust valve. 
Um, you have your piston rod, which connects to your crankshaft, and then you also have your counterweight uh, to reduce vibration. Um, so I uh, will try to stick on topic to save time for questions. And uh, if there's any uh, um, things brought up in the chat, Josh, if you could please just let me know. Uh, I do not see it right now. Um, so moving along, you have your intake, your compression, your power, and your exhaust strokes. Uh, a four-stroke engine has a specific designated stroke for each section. And in a two-stroke, your intake and power are uh, combined and your compression and exhaust are combined to take that four stroke cycle down to two. All right, operating cycle. All reciprocating engines have definite operating cycles, either two or four stroke, as I mentioned before. A stroke is a up or down movement of the piston. Each piston completes two strokes for each revolution of the crankshaft. Uh, in a four stroke, each piston goes through four strokes. The crankshaft has two revolutions, one per cycle, one power stroke per two revolutions of the crankshaft. Uh, so as we saw on the diagram earlier, you have intake, compression, power, and exhaust. Uh, on the intake stroke, uh, the intake valve is open, the exhaust valve is closed, uh, the piston moves down to draw air in through the intake valve uh, that is oxygen rich, oxygen and fuel rich, and the fuel air mixture is drawn in through the intake valve. Uh, so that is designated over here on the left side of your screen. Uh, you have your ambient air drawn in uh, from the exterior of the engine into the cylinder through the intake valve port um, and the piston will start to move in a downward motion and because of the tight clearances of the piston within the cylinder the piston rings and uh, the sealing uh, properties of the oil will create a suction which will help uh, mechanically draw air into the cylinder. Uh, your compression stroke uh, both intake and exhaust valves are closed. Uh, the piston begins, uh, it's finished its downward travel and begins moving up. Fuel and air, the fuel air mixture is compressed. Um, and then once the piston reaches uh, the upper portion of the cylinder, the ignition uh, or it is the fuel air mixture is ignited with a spark and then the compression uh, or compression heats the, uh, the mixture to ignite. Uh, so here in the middle to the left of your screen, you have a uh, representation of the compression stroke. So as we saw in the first stage, uh, air was drawn in through the cylinder. Um, the cylinder has bottomed out of its travel uh, due to the mechanical limitations of the crank. And then as uh, the rotary motion continues, it begins, uh, the rotary motion of the crankshaft continues, it begins driving that piston up. And again, uh, between the tight clearances of the cylinder and the piston, uh, the piston rings, uh, which help seal gases, and then the sealing properties of the lubricating oil uh, begins to compress that uh, oxygen-rich fuel-air mixture towards the top of the cylinder. And then in the next stage uh, is when either in a gasoline engine, a electric spark from a uh, spark plug or the heat of compression um, begins or causes the fuel to ignite which we will expand upon here on the next slide. All right, uh, an operating cycle, the power stroke. The intake and exhaust valves are closed. Um, the piston uh, begins to move down as the uh, fuel air mixture, mixture begins to combust. Uh, and uh, that has a reaction which causes a force that draws the piston down. Um, the crankshaft is continuing to uh, turn, which then uh, the piston has reached the top of its travel and begins to drive down. Uh, power stroke is the only time power is translated to the crankshaft. So back at our diagram here in the center right, um, you can see the ignition happen as denoted by this little uh, fire spark emblem. Um, so the valves at the top, and I forgot to mention in the last slide, um, they're closed. That allows that fuel air mixture to be compressed 
uh, to uh, make the reaction of the ignited fuel air mixture uh, more efficient and powerful. Um, and the crankshaft mechanically has limited the pistons travel towards the top. And because of this rotation of the crankshaft and the ign uh, ignition of the fuel air mixture uh, and the, the seals I mentioned that keep the uh, cylinder clearances tight, drive the piston down, thus creating power to the crankshaft. And as was mentioned in the previous slide, this is the only uh, point in the four-step cycle where power is applied to the crankshaft. And after that, we'll move on to the fourth step, the exhaust stroke. At this point, the intake valve remains closed, the exhaust valve opens, the uh, exhausted gas um, or air, fuel air mixture that's inside the cylinder is forced out uh, due to the piston rising up because it's, it's mechanically hit the bottom of its stroke uh, on the crankshaft and begins moving back up and forces that expend, uh, exhausted uh, gas out of the cylinder and then it begins uh, the cycle all over again. Uh, the piston immediately starts down again and the cycle process starts over as I just mentioned. Uh, so if you look on the right side of your screen, we've reached the bottom of our stroke here on the piston. Uh, the crankshaft mechanically stops the piston from its downward travel. And because the crankshaft is spinning, it uh, reverts back to the beginning of the first stage, forces that exhausted gas out um, and at the top of its travel, it'll close the exhaust valve. The exhaust or, uh, the intake valve will then open and it'll repeat itself. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the differences between a four stroke, which we just went into uh, detail with, to a two stroke. Um, functionally, it's very similar. Uh, it's just uh, condenses the cycle from four strokes to two. Um, this is very prevalent in diesel engines. Um, gasoline engines that are two stroke are uh, um, sometimes small like lawn equipment or like chainsaws um, or as it's noted in this slide, outboard engines as it pertains to the maritime realm. Um, it has one compression and one power stroke. There are no valves. Uh, the piston travels, uh, op piston travel opens the intake and exhaust ports. So as you can see in the differences in this diagram, uh, it, this is obviously a gasoline two stroke because of the spark plug uh, noted at the top. Um, you have your exhaust port here to the side. You have your intake port lower on the opposite side. Um, as uh, the piston comes up, it allows uh, intake air uh, and fuel, the oxygen rich fuel air mixture to come into the cylinder. Um, on, the, on the upstroke and then when it, uh, reaches the top of its travel due to the mechanical limitations of the crankshaft and the connecting rod. Uh, the fuel air mixture is ignited, uh, causing the power stroke to push it down. And on its way down um, from the expent gas, the force that drives it down, and that's again, the only power stroke uh, where this piston provides power to the crankshaft. Um, the exhausted fuel air mixture that's inside the cylinder escapes the exhaust port. Uh, so the operating cycle of a two stroke or diesel, uh, one power stroke for each revolution of the crankshaft, twice as many power strokes as in the four stroke engine. Um, cylinder has exhaust valves, but no intake valve and air comes through ports in the cylinder wall. Uh, two stroke diesels give excellent service. Um, and that is really in the modern Coast Guard as far as the maritime side is uh, considered for the larger boats um, and even the cutter small boats, uh, one of the primary means of power transmission to our uh, inboard outboards or inboard uh, engines or as well as our uh, marine jet drives. Uh, a fuel injection system um, or unit injector in common rail, uh, unit injector cylinder Cylinder and plunger and cylinder head sprays or squirts fuel into combustion chamber for ignition. Fuel is indu inducted from fuel tank to fuel injectors under pressure from a pump. Um, a common rail uh, most, is the most commonly used uh, setup, one pump for all cylinders. So you have one fuel pump for every cylinder of the engine, whether it has four cylinders or uh, 20. Uh, fuel under pressure from tank to cylinder uh, there are drawbacks. The system must be purged of all air until only fuel comes out. Uh, this can be time consuming, 
awkward and messy. It also uh, can cause you some problems when you're troubleshooting a specific uh, casualty with your engineering system, uh, engineering plan, um, and uh, does expose you to the possibility of introducing new problems as you're troubleshooting another. Um, also a different component is called a carburetor. It's a device used to send a fine spray of fuel into a moving stream of air through the intake valves into the combustion chamber in the cylinder head of the engine. Um, this is very popular on small engines. Um, and because of the nature of the fine spray, if you have issues with your fuel, uh, it can cause problems with your fuel air mixture um, once it gets into the cylinder and can cause uh, problems for normal operation. On gasoline engines, uh, this is used to control the fuel, oil, excuse me, fuel air mixture, as I discussed earlier. Um, for your operating cycle, the different compression ratios with compression ratio in diesel of about 14 to one cylinder head temperature at 1000 degrees. This heat ignites the fuel mixture without the spark plug ignition. So that's where we talked about earlier, the heat of compression. Um, diesel compression ratios are close to 14 to 16 to one and gas compression ratios are close to four, uh, four to one uh, to eight to one. Um, Part of that uh, has to do with the volatility of gasoline versus diesel. Uh, the flash point for gasoline is a lot lower than it is diesel. And then also you have the uh, electric ignition from the spark plugs, which requires less compression. Um, power systems include cylinders, pistons, connecting rods, and crankshaft. Uh, cylinders, pistons, and crankshaft, a piston uh, moves up and down in a cylinder attached to the crankshaft and transmits power to the crankshaft. Uh, cylinders are cast in a single engine block with a hardened sleeve alloy to reduce wear. Uh, crankshaft changes the reciprocating motion of the piston and rods into a rotary motion of the crankshaft, which turns your propeller um, or your uh, jet drive impeller. Uh, here is a uh, disassembled um, depiction of a crankshaft. Uh, you have your connecting rods, which connect the piston to the crank rod. And then you have your piston here. Um, this also important is are the uh, piston ring seals. This helps ensure that the gases are contained in the, uh, the top of the cylinder and don't make it past the piston for efficiency uh, and power transmission. And then the crown on the top of the piston is uh, what bears the brunt of the stress of combustion. And then also you have these counterweights on the crankshaft to help uh, reduce uh, rotary force and limit vibration uh, at the higher RPMs that uh, an internal combustion engine can experience. So the things we just talked about, uh, you have to keep in mind when you're uh, even running, you're running at idle in your car, your boat or whatever engine uh, are happening a couple hundred to over a thousand times per sec uh, per minute. And then when you're running at higher RPMs, uh, several thousand uh, revolutions per minute. Um, so having all these in sync and all these little steps we talked about coordinated uh, really will make the difference between a bad day or a good day, uh, either on the road or out on the water. Uh, here is another uh, close-up look of the uh, bottom portion of the connecting rod. This open ring here that I'm circling with my cursor is what actually connects the uh, connecting rod to the crankshaft, which allows the uh, force applied to the piston to turn into rotary motion on the crankshaft, which then gets turned uh, into power on the propeller or uh, on a car, a wheel, or on uh, some of the more modern Coast Guard boats, a uh, jet drive impeller. Uh, this is a depiction of the crank rod with nothing attached to it. You can see there's a bunch of several ports uh, these little holes are in here on purpose. Uh, they are milled throughout the passage, which allow oil to move through. Um, these smooth portions that are shiny are uh, connection points for the connecting rods. Uh, and they're often paired with a bearing uh, to take the brunt of the rotational force and wear caused by the operation of an engine. Um, you have your valve and camshaft. Uh, valves are opened by a camshaft, which is driven by a crankshaft. It lets fresh air in, uh, which allows the proper mixture of oxygen and fuel and other gases to uh, allow for combustion and also allows gases, once they've been exhausted, to vacate. 
Uh, a camshaft changes rotator, rotary to intermittent reciprocating motion. Uh, air is very important um, to any type of fire or combustion. Um, in a four-stroke cycle, air enters through the intake valve. Uh, in a two-stroke cycle, air enters through ports in the cylinder wall. Uh, lubrication with uh, any type of machinery uh, can be uh, the difference between success or failure. Uh, it is vital to the health of the engine. Uh, delivers oil to moving parts to assist the engine in cooling and reduction of friction. Um, engines use uh, a pump and filter uh, to deliver and cleanse uh, the oil to the different components of the engine. Uh, there are also different setups to where at the bottom of the connecting rod, there'll be um, things called tangs, which uh, slap the accumulated oil in the oil pan or sump and uh, allow it to splash around inside the cylinder or the crankshaft housing um, to provide lubrication. Uh, that's more common in smaller engines. Um, when we have the larger sized engines that we use in Coast Guard boats and, and in the maritime field, um, a pump is essential. Uh, water and air as far as the cooling system is uh, concerned. So everything we've been talking about, uh, we derive all our power from combustion. Well, com uh, combustion is a result of friction or uh, an electric spark igniting gases. So basically you're gonna get a lot of heat. Um, I think, I believe it was the first slide, it's talking about taking heat energy uh, into uh, reciprocating motion, turning it into rotary motion, which eventually uh, goes to your propeller or your jet drive impeller. Uh, water in a holding tank, um, often in the Coast Guard, it'd be similar to coolant in a automobile engine. It's called jacket water um, because it forms a jacket around the cylinder uh, due to engineered passages on the component. Um, it circulates throughout the engine um, with a pump and a heat exchanger to draw that heat out of the machinery. Um, by nature, the operation of these uh, pieces of equipment get very hot. So the jacket water or water side is extremely important. Um, the development of that allowed um, further engineering of this type of equipment and uh, just a bit of thermodynamics. Um, the reason why it's able to remove that heat is heat always travels from hot to cold. So you have the increased temperature of the combustion, um, which is obviously hotter than your jacket water. Uh, so the heat from that uh, action of friction and combustion in the cylinder will transfer to your jacket water. And then that'll be given away in your heat exchanger. Um, on like the Great Lakes or rivers, uh, freshwater is used, but in the majority of the maritime field, uh, seawater or raw water is used. Um, the main reason we use that as a cooling medium is just the uh, abundance we have available to us while we're operating a boat on the water. Um, in a car or uh, other land-based uh, heat exchanger systems, you'll use air for a similar reason. Uh, it's readily available and there's plenty of it. Um, when you're operating a boat, it's uh, very difficult to maintain your structural integrity of your boat in your engine compartment um, and allow air in there. So it's much more efficient and safer for the operation of the vessel to use water. Um, fresh water can be used in a self-contained system and seawater uh, comes straight out of whatever source you have, being it a gulf or a bay or the open ocean. Um, you have different electrical components that uh, have been attached to modern engines. You have generators and alternators. Um, generators, uh, in my experience, generally power uh, 120 volt systems such as uh, Air conditioners and other uh, comfort items. Uh, alternators generally run around a 20 volt, 24 volt system and they um, are often used to recharge the uh, vessel's battery so that way you can continuously use your electronic equipment such as your radar, uh, your chart plotters, your depth sounders, your radios, uh, things that we've uh, really come accustomed to in the, the uh, modern, modern maritime field. Um, you have cutouts. Cutouts keep the battery from discharging through the alternator and generator at low speeds. Uh, one of the most important components of an internal combustion engine is the electric starter. Um, they are what start the cycle 
uh, of the rotary motion of the engine and that either four or two stroke uh, application we discussed. Um, once you have uh, closed the circuit to begin the rotation of the engine, um, the engine will start supplying fuel and uh, the engine will get up and running and then the starter will disengage and uh, it'll just keep running on its uh, established motion. Uh, on some of the bigger ships, because of the size they use and the uh, electrical draw that would cause, uh, pneumatic starters are possible, but those require a separate uh, compressed air system. Um, and that's why they're reserved for bigger engines on bigger ships. Um, your battery, uh, is what will power your electronics as well as your starter. Uh, often you will have one designated for the electronics to help you navigate and communicate. Those are generally referred to as house batteries. And uh, there's a whole des a separate designated bank of batteries known as your start batteries. Um, and because of the heavy draw that uh, a cold engine or a non-running engine can cause or require, um, often you will have what's called a parallel uh, function where you can use both batteries to start the engine and then once the engine is started uh, you will disengage that feature and the start batteries will be put to rest and the house batteries will control your electronics. Uh, a wiring harness is generally used to carry the electricity um, from the battery to the engine and then also from the uh, generator or alternator components uh, to your equipment or to the charging system for your batteries. Um, in your ignition systems, you have your ignition coil, you have a mechanical breaker, a condenser, a distributor, spark plugs, switch, and wiring. Um, so your components that we just discussed, uh, you have your ignition coil, uh, the generated power source uh, for the spark and the spark plug, uh, your mechanical breaker or uh, points, uh, break the current at the proper time. Uh, your condenser prevents arcing uh, when the points are open, your distributor serves as a selector switch to distribute the current to the individual spark plugs, and that's in a gas engine only. Uh, spark plugs and gasoline engines only provide the fire uh, to ignite the fuel in the combustion chamber. Um, and the spark comes from the ignition coil, not the battery. Um, your primary ignition circuit and a low voltage gasoline engine, uh, you have your battery your ignition switch, ignition coil on the low side, breaker points in your distributor, and your condenser. Uh, your secondary ignition circuit, or in a high voltage gasoline engine, you'll have a distributor, which is rotary, and your ignition coil on the high side, and your spark plugs. Um, when it comes to troubleshooting, a uh, gas engine will require the correct fuel air mixture. So if you have too much of one, uh, it'll hinder the other and you will, uh, result, it will result in either failure to run or improper operation. Um, you need to ensure you have good compression, which uh, as I mentioned before, um, is a result of the valves closing during the compression stroke. Um, good seal on your piston rings. Uh, piston rings are gapped. So when you're installing them, um, depending on how many you have, uh, you wanna have them uh, an equal specified distance. So let's say you have uh, three rings on a cylinder, you have 360 degrees in a circle, so your ring spaces should be 120 degrees apart from each other. So let's just say that would be like your 12 o'clock position, your 5 o'clock position, and your, oh, we'll go with 7 o'clock position. Um, and you also need to make sure you have good spark. Um, good spark can be hindered by poor gaps on your spark plugs or uh, accumulation of carbon particles uh, from your combustion cylinder accumulating on uh, the end of your spark plug. Uh, with diesel engines, you need to make sure they have the correct fuel pressure. Uh, pressure needs to be adequate to ensure you have the fine atomized spray from the injector uh, that allows the mixture to be correct uh, for the compression um, and the heat that is required to get that to ignite during that compression. So that brings us to our second step, high compression and you need to ensure that you have no air in the fuel lines. Uh, we discussed that a little bit earlier. If you uh, do not purge your fuel lines, you can be introducing air into your cylinders and it will not restrict motion, but you will not achieve combustion if that is the case. 
Okay, um, so we have a few questions here. Uh, all reciprocating engines have a definite cycle of operation uh, and blank. Uh, so we have option A, operate on either a two or four stroke cycle. Uh, B, the number of cycles depends on the number of cylinders. Or C, the two stroke cycle is, off, off, is used only in diesel engines since four stroke cycles require proper function of gasoline engines. Uh, let's see what A says. Okay, so the correct answer was A, all reciprocating engines have a definite cycle of operation and operate on either a two or four stroke cycle. And we explained that earlier. Um, if we have uh, some questions later, we can dive into that a little bit more. Uh, review question two, the camshaft blank. Uh, camshaft drives the propeller. B, carries cams that are usually squared shape. C, is used to rotate the cams that open the valves or D, changes reciprocating motion into rotary motion. Well, let's see what C has to say. So that is the correct answer. Uh, C, the camshaft is used to rotate the cams that open the valves. Uh, so that's basically as far as the proper sequencing of the cycle that uh, supports the uh, four stroke system or uh, to ensure the valves are open and closed at the appropriate times. Uh, question three. Diesel engines have high compression ratios in the range of 16 to one to 20 to one in order to A, easily exhaust heavy diesel fuel, B, provide maximum power in the intake stroke, C, compress air to generate heat for fuel ignition, or D, assist the entrance of fuel from the carburetor. Let's see what C has to say. C is the correct answer. Um, because diesel engines do not have a uh, spark emitting device, um, or spark plugs as we're commonly referred to. Diesel engines have high compression ratios in the range of 16 to one to 20 to one in order to compress air to generate heat for fuel ignition. Um, we have review question four. A two stroke engine blank has a compression and power stroke. B is only used in diesel engines. C has twice the power in very large gasoline engines. Is so and D is so designated because there is a cycle of two strokes between the opening and closing of the exhaust valves of each cylinder. Let's see what A is. All right, A is the correct uh, response. A two-stroke engine, A has a compression and power stroke. Uh, the intake and exhaust strokes are combined with the uh, compression and power strokes. Uh, moving on, question five, in a diesel engine, fuel blank is A, injected directly into the cylinder or combustion chamber, B, is mixed with air then injected into the cylinder, C, is used for lubrication, or D, consumption is constant at all speeds. Uh, let's see what A has to say. A is the correct answer. Uh, in a diesel engine, fuel is injected directly into the cylinder or combustion chamber. Uh, and this aids uh, in the process uh, ensuring that you have your good fine atomized mist of fuel uh, to be mixed with intake air um, to allow for proper uh, compression and ignition in the combustion chamber. Uh, question six, in a gasoline engine, the fuel air mixture ratio is controlled by the A, throttle, B, carburetor, C, intake valve, or D, fuel pump. Let's, let's go with B. And that was the correct response. In a gasoline engine, the fuel air mixture ratio is controlled by the carburetor. Uh, review question seven. Lubricating oil in engines blank. A is used for ignition and for friction reduction. B is used only to lubricate the bearings and bushings. C is always under constant pressure. D is used to reduce friction and increase cooling. I got a good feeling about D. Let's see what D has to say. D was right. Uh, lubricating oil in engines is used to reduce friction and increase cooling. Uh, question eight, which of the following groups of items are common to both the diesel and four cycle gasoline engines? Valves, carburetors, and fuel pumps. Valves, pistons, and spark plugs. Valves, cylinders, and fuel pumps or valves distributor and carburetor? 
Uh, let's go with B. Well, I have officially been stumped, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, which of the following groups of items are common to both the diesel and four cycle gasoline engines? You have C, your valves, cylinders, and fuel pump. Uh, question nine, the primary circuit of the ignition system for gasoline engines includes A, distributor and breaker points, B, battery and spark plugs, C, ignition coil and breaker points, or D, ignition coil and distributor. And the answer was C, ignition coil and breaker points. The primary circuit of the ignition system for gasoline engines includes the C, ignition coil and breaker points. And question 10, the primary circuit of ignition system for gasoline engine includes the A, battery, B, condenser, C, breaker points, or D, ignition coil. And it looks like I've been able to redeem myself. The correct answer was D, ignition coil, the high voltage that produces the spark and spark in spark plug in a, in a spark plug in a gasoline engine is produced by the ignition coil. Um, and that is the end of this PowerPoint for this lesson. Uh, I'm gonna get out of here. <clears throat> that was excellent, uh, uh, Taylor. And it brought back many memories of engineering from my youth. So uh, lots of great uh, information. So for, if anyone has questions, please type them into the Q&A feature and uh, we will answer them as they come up. I will also be checking on Facebook to see if we have any questions there. So there are, uh, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've seen the Aspen many times. So I wonder if we've bumped into each other in past lives. And uh, there's some old Sea Scout boats that have two stroke generators. Uh, and those those things scream. They're really loud. Why is that? Uh, in my experience, two strokes are always louder than four. Um, and I honestly forget uh, as to why. Um, perhaps you'd be able to help me out. Uh, I was I was <laughs> I was not trying to stump you, but oh, gotcha. Uh, you know, it's like those are. No one wants a two-stroke engine anymore because they're loud, and places like Lake Tahoe don't permit them. And you know, do you, you know, like why would someone prefer a four-stroke engine over a two-stroke engine? Uh, I know in the outboard community, a lot of people who are willing to deal with the noise of a two-stroke uh, argue that uh, the power output is higher. Uh, a lower horsepower engine will be able to provide you more power than a uh, larger four-stroke. Um, but you will enjoy a quieter ride. Uh, I personally have a four stroke 225 horsepower Yamaha on my boat and uh, no complaints here. I'm sure that's fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the, the main difference between diesel and gasoline burning engines besides the lack of spark plugs and using, using ether to light off the main engine? Like why, how, how are they different fuel sources? Well, definitely I know, um, and I've asked this question a few times, uh, the efficiency you get in fuel consumption with a diesel engine, especially a larger one, and as you would see in the marine application um, for a larger size boat, uh, is just unparalleled. Um, you'll get more horsepower and you're, uh, you're more bang for your buck, so to speak. Um, a lot of times you'll see our smaller boats on Coast Guard ships uh, will also run diesel. It'll be an inboard outboard setup uh, in most cases. Uh, I know uh, outboard diesels are in development currently, but uh, none are in service in the Coast Guard to my knowledge. Um, and the main reason for that is just for the convenience of only having to store one kind of fuel. Uh, you only have so much room on a ship and uh, if the big guy uses X, then the little guy's gonna use X too. Uh, that makes a lot of sense from an operational standpoint. So let's, uh, so let's talk about if there's a difference between the engine in a ship's engine uh, and a smaller boat's engine. So again, if you have 
uh, I grew up on an army T-boat. They have those at the Coast Guard Academy as well. You know, those have uh, a 670, or excuse me, a, a D375 or a straight six or a Buddha, uh, depending on where they were built versus something like that has an outboard. Like what's, what are the differences between like why you would have one over the other? Um, so a lot of times uh, the way things that are set up in uh, the realm that I've been dealing with for the last 15 years is basically just economy of space. Um, in addition to what we were just discussing, where if you have the ability to only run on one type of fuel and you only need to stock your reserves with only one type of fuel, that's uh, provide its own conveniences in that regard. Um, an outboard will definitely um, provide you a uh, much easier distribution of weight. Um, diesels by nature tend to be uh, substantially bigger than gasoline engines. And uh, a lot of that has to do with the power requirements that uh, are needed for whatever your particular application could be. And so in my experience, uh, your main diesel engines on your ship are basically the heart of your propulsion plant. So let's, uh, let's get into the, the fact that if you haven't had to work on an, uh, in an engine while underway, you know, let's just say that it's, you know, between waves, you, you haven't lived. And oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> so how easy is it to work on an engine while at sea? And I'm very excited to hear your Coast Guard life stories with, with uh, the challenge with that. Well, obviously the uh, dynamic environment of uh, any maritime application uh, brings about its own challenges. Um, to that end, most of the maintenance we do, heavy duty overhauls, uh, you know, tune-ups, things like that, we try to do in port when we have a relatively stable platform. I mean, obviously you're not immune to getting waked out by uh, passing traffic, but uh, when uh, you have a casualty um, and you don't really have a choice but to fix it or at least figure out how to make it uh, not a detriment to the, the ship itself or the crew, um, it definitely poses in it a few problems. Um, Odds are, if you're working on a, a component, uh, the engine's off, so your propulsion capabilities are reduced by half or completely in some regards. Um, and you get uh, caught in what is referred to as the trough, <laughs> uh, which is the lower part of the wave. Uh, and most times you're a, uh, at the mercy of whatever the predominant force is, whether that be the seas or the wind, or sometimes they work against each other to make it extra fun. Um, and... <laughs> by the nature of what we do in the Coast Guard, uh, a lot of our equipment is very heavy, sturdy um, to deal with that combustion that we just discussed for the last half hour. Um, so it's heavy cast steel. Um, sometimes there's aluminum components, but uh, normally the good stuff isn't, isn't light. Um, so it definitely poses some challenges. Um, you rarely, uh, you'd be working on something alone. Um, you're normally spotted with a couple people. Um, and uh, if you've got a good, uh, good crew up on the bridge, which more often than not you do, they, uh, they do their best to keep you nose into the seas to give you the best ride possible. Or uh, often it's nose into the seas if you're in a casualty situation, but maybe a downswell run might be more appropriate. Or if they, the generator's out and you're working in the dark. So again, there's all kinds of magical sea stories that I'm sure you have. Been so we, <laughs> so uh, here's a fun question. Are diesel starter engines powered by diesel as well? And how are they engaged? Uh, I have not encountered a diesel starter engine um, in my time. Uh, I would imagine they're a, an older setup or an older configuration or something on a larger application I've yet to see. Um, generally in a typical electric starter, um, you have uh, a Bendix arm that moves out and connects to the flywheel. It's a angled conical uh, tooth gear that spins at a high rate of speed uh, for that electric motor and basically um, gets the components of the engine moving. And then uh, the electronic managing portion of the engine continues the fuel pump running um, and allows the four two-stroke cycle to take effect. And once it's reached its uh, designated uh, idle RPM, um, it'll quit sending electricity uh, to the starter and the electrical mechanism that allows the Bendix arm to stick out will retract and the engine will take over from there. 
So we there's a question on Facebook, and um, I think this is a great way to talk about what a direct reverse drive engine is. Uh, but the, the question is, when at full stop, does the diesel engine shut down or go into idle? And uh, care to elaborate on what happens? Uh, I apologize. I'm not familiar with that type of setup. So, uh, they're old. So OK. Uh, uh, President Roosevelt's yacht, the Potomac, which is now in San Francisco Bay, is a direct reverse drive. So there, okay. it doesn't have neutral. So it, it's either ahead or off, or reverse or off. So if, if like that doesn't really idle, it, it's either on or it's off. Um, every Coast Guard boat uh, in the fleet today would be able to idle. They don't shut off if they're idling. So um, so yeah. Fun, fun question there. We do uh, encounter something similar to that if uh, we do experience a, a casualty in our reduction gears, which is also a component in between the engine and the propeller shaft. Um, if we have a major failure in the operating components of that, we uh, just about every Coast Guard reduction gear or be similar to a uh, like transmission in your car has what's referred to as a come home feature. Uh, where you mechanically lock the gears together. And it's a similar setup where if uh, the engine's on, you're going. So it sounds like uh, those uh, share that, uh, that circumstance. Indeed. So here's one that uh, you know, many Sea Scout leaders like to, to acquire parts, the just-in-case scenario. And it's the question of how much do you carry with you? So at sea, do you carry enough parts to rebuild an engine? And if, and so what are uh, repair capabilities? And I'm basically, do you have enough parts to build a second engine or re completely rebuild it uh, while underway? So the short answer to that is no. Um, in most cases, um, the way the Coast Guard is set up is we have the Surface Forces Logistics Center at the Coast Guard Yard in Baltimore. And um, for those of you who haven't been on uh, a ship of uh, grand size, uh, most engines are set up to where when one needs to be replaced, it needs to be cut out of the side of the ship, which requires a uh, lengthy dry dock period where the boat is hauled out of the water and cut out and removed and replaced with another created engine. And that uh, damaged engine will be sent to the Surface Forces Logistics Center and rebuilt in a climate controlled uh, shop uh, waiting to be shipped out to be replaced uh, wherever it may be needed. Um, that's actually a pretty hot button issue since I've been in the Coast Guard uh, for years and years and years. Um, people stuck out at sea, myself included, want to be able to fix the uh, equipment that we're uh, keeps us moving around, keeps the light on. And, you know, if you've been in the Caribbean or, or the South Pacific, uh, the air conditioning running. Um, so we do try to uh, outfit um, the ship with uh, significant replacement parts. Um, however, uh, what the Coast Guard was finding is uh, stockpiles of parts were getting um, stored on boats which in turn makes it heavier, which costs more fuel to conduct your mission, raising your operating costs. And then uh, in addition to that, um, as uh, was discussed earlier, I've been to several units myself in my 15 years. So maybe I know where it is, but then I leave after a year and a half for you know, my tour of three years. And the new guy has no idea that there's a new fuel pump or a cylinder head in the back corner of the drawer in the, the storeroom. Um, so we've tried to get away from outfitting the ship with replacements for everything. Um, your high risk, relatively simple swap outs, um, injectors, um, gaskets, rings, seals, bearings, things like that, um, we try to hold on to. Um, so that way we can either uh, find safe harbor, uh, make a port call somewhere. Uh, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba is a great spot for things like this. Um, Cause you do have some engineering support there and it's also, uh, a pretty sound place to receive parts. Um, our US Coast Guard storekeepers are very, very good at uh, getting stuff to us uh, when in need. And also with the size um, that these ships are, um, you're talking about hundreds to thousands of pounds for some of these components. Uh, we blew a turbo on the Aspen one time 
on the uh, port engine. And uh, that happened Thursday night. And uh, by Friday night, when we pulled into LA Long Beach, uh, there was a new turbo waiting on the pier that had been shipped from uh, Baltimore. So uh, sometimes the wheels get greased and uh, heaven and earth moves to make things like that happen. Um, but to short answer the question, no, we do not stock enough parts to rebuild everything. Um, within reason, we try to keep consumables on hand. Um, and through experience, uh, we try to outfit the ship with whatever we'll need, um, anticipating casualties, but also um, hourly base maintenance. Um, you know, when you're out there running a generator for, you know, 24 hours every other day, or sometimes longer if you're required to run uh, both of your generators in parallel, um, you're going to need oil changes. You're going to need um, gaskets. You're going to need filters, you know, so these are things we do uh, routinely. We try to uh, plan them uh, when it's advantageous, when we have good weather or when we can make a port call. Um, and you'd be surprised how uh, fast somebody can change some oil on a generator when their Liberty's waiting on it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Liberty is uh, when you have time off, when you pull a ship into port for a day or two to get a little bit of rest. Uh, we're familiar with that too, but uh, we don't have the budget of the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, so a uh, question that we have, does the Coast Guard have tenders to support vessels on longer cruises? Uh, designated tenders for longer cruises, no. Um, we make port enough to where generally we'll have parts meet us. Um, when we are out operating, um, if something we, uh, if anybody, any baseball fans out there, your cutoff man, um, sometimes we'll have uh, a smaller patrol boat like a 110, an FRC or an 87, um, grab parts and uh, ferry them out to whatever larger platform or, or uh, different platform might need them. Um, uh, or, uh, apologize, I lost my train of thought. Um, we could do what's called a vert rep, a vertical vertical replenishment at sea to where a uh, predominantly a uh, UH-60 uh, Jayhawk, uh, just because of their uh, hoisting capabilities, will uh, deliver it to them. So we'll, we'll try to, uh, oh, there's a good thing. I meant to mention this earlier, but I lost my train of thought while I was talking about other stuff. Um, the Coast Guard uses a great principle, whether you're operating equipment or learning about equipment called redundancy, where we will often have two of everything. So it's very rare that both things break at the same time. And sometimes you can kind of rob Peter to pay Paul um, to where if uh, something breaks, you can remain on your one engine. Um, and then if you need to, you can kind of cannibalize the, the uh, good components on the down engine to keep the running engine uh, up and good to go, fully mission capable uh, until you can make port or find a, a way to receive uh, logistical support. Adventures that uh, we know well and uh, I'm sure we could do a webinar just with good sea stories about engineering adventures uh, and repairs that people have done over the, the decades, because uh, there's lots of good stories. So with that, um, uh, Bruce, do you uh, want to highlight what we have next month? And also, uh, if people have topic requests for future webinars. I sure do, Josh. Thanks so much. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Taylor. That was a great presentation. Uh, and I know that uh, the uh, Sea Scouts got a lot out of it. Um, next month's uh, uh, Coast Guard Tech Talks will be on rules of the road. So you may want to study ahead to be prepared for that. And if you have uh, ideas for future topics for Coast Guard Tech Talks, um, please uh, email me. My, co my uh, email address is bruce.johnson at cgauxnet.us, c-g-a-u-x-n-e-t dot u-s. I've typed that into the chat for those of you who are on Zoom. Uh, we would love to make sure that we're uh, providing you with the talks that you're interested in hearing. Thanks so much. So Josh, I think that's maybe it for this evening. Thank you, Taylor.